Wednesday night, we told you about the terrible situation going on at Riverside County Animal Shelters. Tonight, we'll speak with a legal expert on the issue. Welcome to the show. We were off last night for the State of the Union, and we're going to do something a little different tonight. Elia Sandusky put together a series of reports on the Salton Sea, the mysterious Salton Sea. There were three parts, and traditionally, you run one part a night for three nights. Given we don't really care about tradition and we make our own rules, we're going to let you see the whole thing as part of tonight's show. And as a bonus, it's really good. So, Olivia, the floor is yours. A photo on Facebook by a local wildlife photographer showed me that there is an incredible amount of wildlife at the Salton Sea. And it turns out it's extremely important as a resource for migrating birds. And there's a change that's taking place. So tonight we look at part one, it's life at the Salton Sea. This is all going to turn that beautiful pink purple layer called the Belt of Venus. It's sunrise at the Sunny Bono Salt and Sea National Wildlife Refuge. Coyotes trot along berms in a pack. A snowy egret and white face ibis forage for food. And in the distance, thousands of snow geese take off at first light, traveling as a noisy flock to a nearby agriculture field. Look at that, you guys. Award-winning wildlife photographer Paulette Donellen captures life at the sea's managed wetlands. It's my therapy. We share this planet with these wonderful animals and birds, and just to be here with them and watch them is just, it's very peaceful for me. These water birds are part of about 400 species who call the sea home for the winter. The water serves as one of the only available resting points in the area during their migration along the Pacific Flyway. Look at the cranes. And Paulette enjoys sharing images from their stop at the wildlife refuge. This is absolutely my, one of my favorite spots to shoot. There's a cute little green heron that hangs out here that I love to photograph. There's great blue herons. By the way, 70% of the burrowing owl population in California lives down here at the Salton Sea. Those burrowing owls have babies and that's the best time to watch. This lively refuge sits at the southern border of the Salton Sea, the largest body of water in the state. At 343 square miles, it's roughly three and a half times the size of Palm Springs. However, it's also the most toxic as its primary water source is chemical heavy runoff from nearby farms and recent water restrictions and evaporation have caused the sea to lose a third of its water mass, creating pollution water and soil, which poses as a health threat and leads to a decline in wildlife habitat. To understand just how far the water has receded, we're hundreds of yards away from the shore and the sand is filled with nothing but seashells. Now, however, there is one positive change that's taking place as the water shrinks. It's leaving behind thousands of acres of natural wetlands. Unlike most of the man-made refuge, which is flooded by water from Imperial Irrigation District, these wetlands are created by runoff and underground springs. Naturally occurring wetlands began to spring up by um, the growing of, of plants like cattails and other bulrushes. A lot of natural wetlands have been lost due to development and so any wetlands that can be protected and conserved and managed is hugely important to, to migratory bird species. Jonathan Shore's team studies the impact of wetlands on the community. Aside from providing habitat, he says the ecosystems are also playing an important role in reducing the amount of toxic dust that blows to nearby neighborhoods. As the irrigation water flushes, the barren playa, the cattail grows, the tamarisk or salt cedar grows, and that basically stabilizes the soil so that these particulate matters that can get blown up by large wind events doesn't happen and improves the air quality. These new wetlands are fragile, and without support, more water loss could cause them to collapse as quickly as they formed, pushing migrating birds and some of their food sources like the desert pupfish to disappear. That's why Jonathan's team continues to create and restore more managed areas at the refuge, including marshes, open water, and brackish ponds. We farm about 800 acres of annual ryegrass, like this field behind us, which provides a winter food for about 30,000 snow and Ross's geese. And then we manage uh, a couple thousand other acres of wetlands for other migratory birds. Other projects are also underway to support life at the shrinking sea. It's a large and expensive undertaking, but aims to ensure that birds, 
fish and nearby communities can rely on the habitat for years to come. There is hope that the projects that are being developed are going to create habitat that will persist in the future. There is a lot of hope and it shouldn't be considered a toxic sea. It's very much alive. Okay, so I mentioned there are some other projects that are underway. There's actually a 10-year plan, and we just passed the halfway mark. So let's look at some of the other work that's being done by the state and local nonprofits to restore the Salton Sea. You are looking at a remarkable idea, an idea that has intrigued and attracted and literally thrilled, for this is the story of the miracle sea in the desert, the Salton Sea. Once known as a bustling tourist attraction, the Salton Sea's reputation has changed to a shrinking and polluted body of water due to a decline in Colorado river flow and agriculture runoff. And on the eastern shore, the once popular resort town, Bombay Beach, has turned into a partially abandoned artistic community, home to just 200 people. But as the water pulls away from the town, a change is taking place, giving the area new life. And nonprofit Audubon California is working to support it. There is a phenomenon happening here around the Salton Sea. As the water from the agricultural runoffs are no longer meeting the Salton Sea, the water has permeated through the ground, creating these beautiful wetlands. And Audubon was able to quantify over 6,000 new acres of uh, what we call emerging wetlands. And this is critical because a lot of the birds use these areas for roosting, nesting, breeding. And Audubon decided to expand them, protect them, and uh, create a model that can be implemented elsewhere. The permitting process is expected to be finished in 2025. And a few miles down the beach, more important work is underway. The state's Salt and Sea Management Program has started their third vegetation enhancement project, covering a total of 1,700 acres of exposed shoreline with native plants stabilizing the soil and reducing toxic dust. The first phase has been completed. Projects are aimed to enhance vegetation uh, with a uh, little less use of water, uh, reducing the emissions from the emissive lake bed. The project here at Bombay Beach is just a small part of the 10-year plan to restore the sea. In total, about 30,000 acres will be revitalized. This map shows the operations that are part of the state's 10-year plan. Dust control efforts are in green. The rest highlight the other projects that are underway. Some, like the 60-acre Torres Martinez wetland, have already been completed, but the species species conservation habitat won't be finished for at least a few years. This extensive project sits at the sea's southern end. It's the state's first large-scale habitat restoration effort, creating a network of ponds for birds and fish. This 4,100-acre project, it's uh, about $206 million investment. And recently, in December, the federal government supported this same project with $70 million. Uh, it has the potential, with this funding, to expand about 1,000 acres more. The state's goal is to finish the 10-year plan by 2028. It will cost about $400 million to complete, but a lack of funding for certain projects has delayed timelines, sometimes for years. Another challenge? Collaboration of landowners. The Salton Sea is divided up like a complex checkerboard, with the state owning less than 2%. From working in collaboration with so many different entities, working with many different regulators, who is doing what, when, how, Wow. And as these conversations take time, toxic dust from the sea continues to impact air quality for those living in the area. Miguel says the state is working directly with those affected. We take their input to the extent that we can to make sure that we're addressing not only their concerns, but also their recommendations to how we can improve our projects. But the 10-year plan won't solve all of the sea's problems as the shoreline continues to shrink. To address the environmental crisis, some have proposed large-scale solutions like importing ocean water. But that idea was rejected by a state panel. Now, Frank believes it's time for the groups involved to look for less water-based solutions to find answers beyond 2028. And with that, I mean that using very little water, whatever is available, and maximize it. They need to ramp up, you know, the efforts to make sure, you know, they cover the play, they provide more habitat. Um, so the clock is ticking.